This programme is about change. Change in our world and change in the way scientists view it. We'll be travelling to Antarctica to learn about how its unique and potentially valuable biology is evolving. And we go to Switzerland, where physicists are attempting the most ambitious experiment of all time. First, we delve into the chemistry of water to report on a potentially alarming but hitherto little understood consequence of climate change. The greenhouse effect of increasing levels of atmospheric carbon dioxide is well known. However, a recent Royal Society report has drawn attention to another consequence of CO2 on the world's oceans. A co-author of the report is Professor Andrew Watson. Carbon dioxide uh, from the atmosphere dissolves into the surface oceans quite readily on quite, you know, quite a short time scale. Of course, much of it also uh, comes back out again as well, so there's a continuous exchange between the atmosphere and the ocean. Now what happens uh, when a carbon dioxide molecule goes in uh, to the surface ocean, uh, it dissolves in the seawater and on a time, uh, uh, within about a minute, it has associated with a water molecule. So you get hydrogen carbonate, sometimes called carbonic acid, H2CO3. And then quite shortly after that, uh, that dissociates, uh, knocking off a hydrogen ion and a bicarbonate ion, that's the rest, the HCO3. So you produce roughly one hydrogen ion for every carbon dioxide molecule that goes in uh, to, to the surface ocean. And an increase in the hydrogen ion concentration means that you're going to decrease the pH, increase the acidity of the oceans. Some of the creatures that are most strongly affected are the ones that uh, secrete calcium carbonate. They make shells or they make uh, tests or internal skeletons or external skeletons out of that. Now there are all sorts of creatures that do that. Crustaceans, oysters, shellfish, all produce actual shells. But then there are also many creatures such as plankton, you know, some of them unicellular, microscopic plankton. And in fact, it's probably the open ocean plankton which, which produce the most, even though the, the shoreline organisms and the shallow water organisms are perhaps the ones that we're most familiar with. The different organisms produce basically two different kinds of, of calcium carbonate. One is uh, calcite, so the coccolithophores, for instance, which produce the most, mostly produce calcite. But another is aragonite, and for example, coral reefs are mostly aragonite. These are different mineral forms. They're the same chemical composition, but different mineral forms, in other words, a different lattice, if you like, of calcium carbonate. And a critical difference is that aragonite is quite a bit more soluble than calcite. So the creatures that are more susceptible to change are going to be the ones that produce aragonite. We really don't understand the workings of this rather complex system. It possibly is in the realm of the corals, where humans will see the effects most readily. They can't produce their aragonite structures so readily if you acidify the water, even you know, by 0.1, 0.2 pH units. So they will be affected. They're already being stressed, so this is an extra stress on them. And uh, yeah, not very good news, therefore, for, for coral reefs. Another ecosystem under threat from climate change is Antarctica. This isolated, extreme continent is an almost ideal natural laboratory for biologists, with many secrets still waiting to be unlocked. Now scientists are in a race against time to learn all they can before it's too late. The benefits of living in the Antarctic continent are lack of competition. As with all extreme environments, if an organism can adapt to exploit that new environment, then it doesn't suffer competition from other animals. So it's a, it's a trade-off between the costs of overcoming the stresses and the benefits of lack of competition. And what we see in the Antarctic is some very highly specialised organisms that are existing in large numbers because they just don't have the competition. When you talk about how cold an environment is, the important thing is not the level to which the temperature drops to, it's whether it's frozen or not. 
Once water freezes, it starts to disrupt cellular mechanisms, it starts to prevent biochemical activities within the cell, and it starts to disrupt life as we're more familiar with it. So I think the important thing is whether water freezes or not, and whether ice crystals are produced, and that's what makes life so difficult in the Antarctic. Once it gets very cold, so in the very coldest parts of the continent, at minus 80 degrees centigrade, you wouldn't see any life there at all. One of the most interesting things about cold adaptation are there are patterns that you can see across the kingdoms. So you can look at bacteria, you can look at archaea, you can look at higher organisms and the cells within those higher organisms. And the same sort of patterns of adaptation to cold environments are seen across all of them. And these can include things like enzyme modification. So enzymes might become activated at a lower temperature. They may modify their structures so that they're more flexible mm -hmm. and they may be less susceptible to warm-induced inactivation. You might also see changes in the membrane lipids so that the flexibility of a membrane decreases as the temperature decreases. Another thing they might do is produce antioxidants and antioxidants are chemicals which prevent cellular damage following freezing. Another thing that's more recently been discovered are cold shock proteins and these cold shock proteins are produced in response to cold stress. So all the suite of mechanisms taken together help animals to adapt to the cold. The whole of the Antarctic continent is, is particularly vulnerable to climate change because of the extremely rapid nature of the warming. A lot of the organisms that live there have to live in a trade-off between metabolizing and producing compounds which enable them to live in the cold and the lack of competition. So as the temperature increases, so the levels of competition will increase, they're already existing at edges of their tolerance. So you probably see that they, they would either have to move or they'd die out. Some people would argue that the Antarctic continent is quite poor in terms of species composition. As temperature increases, we would expect there to be a growth in that diversity. So in the short term, you might actually see an increase in the levels of the diversity. But some of the work that we've done at the British Antarctic Survey has shown that a large proportion of the microorganisms present in the Antarctic environment are new to science, and up to 80% of them haven't been studied before. So if we, we're in a position where we have an increasing global temperature, we start losing some of these novel species because non-Antarctic organisms start to migrate in and fill those niches, then we could be losing the potential to discover novel biochemicals, new pharmaceuticals, and new enzymes and methods of gene expression that we haven't even got to understand yet. While biologists are going literally to the ends of the Earth, physicists are going to even greater extremes to ask questions about the origins of the universe. Nearing completion in Switzerland is the largest scientific experiment ever attempted. The aim is to recreate the conditions present in the universe less than one billionth of a second after the Big Bang. The Large Hadron Collider at CERN has been built with such a high energy that we know that it goes beyond our understanding. Our theory is not capable of describing what is going to be seen there. So it's, it's guaranteed that we'll see some new phenomena. We've got to the point where we think that everything in the world that we see, so our bodies, the stars, planets, planet Earth, the Moon, are made of basically three fundamental particles actually. Two particles called the up quark and the down quark, and the electron that goes around the up quark and the down quark which make up the atomic nucleus. There's also a particle called a neutrino, the electron neutrino, which is intimately related with the way the sun shines. We also think there are four forces in the universe. Gravity, the most familiar, but by far the weakest. The other three are the strong force, which sticks the nucleus together, the weak force, which is involved in hydrogen burning inside the sun, and electromagnetism. In some ways, when you tell the story, it sounds really simple, and indeed, I suppose it is. But actually, that hides a lot. The, the masses of the particles, so how heavy those things are, is a complete mystery and a very complicated pattern. The neutrinos, for example, are, are not massless. Light's massless, so the photon, the particle of light, flies around at the speed of light, that's fine. Neutrinos are slightly heavier than nothing, <laughs> but not much. And then 15 orders of magnitude heavier is the heaviest quark, called the top quark, which is heavier than a gold nucleus. That pattern is not understood at all. It's, it's, it's bizarre in some sense. I mean, why would the world be like that? We know 
the profound things that we don't know. What we need now is a clue, a signpost to where to go next. The, the Large Hadron Collider, it's a very simple idea actually. It's basically get some protons, whiz them around as fast as you can, smash them into each other. And you do that not because you want to know what's inside the proton, but just to get a lot of energy in a very small space. You do that by having a 27 in kilometre circumference machine, which is the Large Hadron Collider. It sits about 100 metres below the, the ground, straddles the French Swiss border. And there, basically, to picture it, there are two beams of particles in there, one going one way, one going the other way, protons, which would fit inside the zero on a 20 pence piece, but carry as much energy as an aircraft carrier going at 30 miles an hour. So it's, it, you know, it's an incredibly violent kind of regime. And you smash these things together, and all that energy gets focused into something the size of a proton. So really what you're doing is, is you're creating the conditions that were present in the universe less than a billionth of a second after the Big Bang in a very small space, in the lab, and then you're basically putting a camera around that bit of space and taking a picture of it. So it's just like getting a big camera going back in time to the Big Bang and having a look <laughs> and see, see what goes on. The detectors themselves are, are, are massive. The, the one I work on, Atlas, sits in a cavern bigger than St Paul's Cathedral. You can imagine that, 100 metres below the surface. It weighs 7,000 tonnes. In some sense, it's just a digital camera, but it's a hell of a big digital camera. The data flow is 10,000 Encyclopedia Britannicas per second out of that experiment. So that actually requires a computing infrastructure that you wouldn't believe. You can imagine it's a lot of hard drives to do that. And you've got to sift through all that data. And you're looking for needles in haystacks. I mean, really, needles in haystacks. It's, you know, we, we, we will have billions and billions of proton-proton collisions in that detector. Really what we're doing is we're looking for new particles, particles that we haven't seen before that will get made in these violent collisions. And you've got to try and patch them back together. And that's, that's the trick actually, that's, that's where the skill is once you've built this thing, which is engineering skill, then you turn it on and you've then got to have analysis skill and physics intuition to go find the interesting stuff. We're guaranteed to see the mechanism that produced mass in the universe within three or four years of, of turning the machine on. We have to see that because we built this machine at an energy where we know that process happened. The, the, the real big questions are, why is gravity so weak? Gravity is 10 to the power 40 times weaker than the strong force. That, that needs an explanation. There's a, an anti-gravity force in the universe that's been discovered, which is called dark energy. Einstein called it the cosmological constant. It seems that distant galaxies are being pushed away from each other at ever-increasing rates. We don't understand that, and it seems to be about 70% of the energy in the universe tied up in there. So that there, are, there are some very profound questions. I would guess that, well, certainly the origin of mass in the universe, probably dark matter, those things will be explained if I were to put money on it. Uh, now, whether the gravitational question, which is the big question, that requires us to be lucky as well as clever. But, you know, there's, a, there's not a, there's a chance.